Well, hey everybody, I'm Ross Trelevin. I'm Executive Vice President of Sprite Pest Solutions and welcome to our Bed Bug Spotlight Series. Today, we're gonna to go through our first uh, presentation on bed bugs. And with us today is uh, Jeff White, who's our, the Technical Director from Bed Bug Central. In business, uh, both on our side and on your side, I know that it is great to have wonderful partners. And Jeff and Bedbug Central have been on the front lines, traveling the world, learning, researching, and developing products and procedures for Sprague and for many other partner companies of theirs for many years. Uh, Bedbug Central is one of those companies who has really helped us bring something new to the marketplace each time that we've uh, that we found new science to follow. Uh, so Jeff is. Uh, uh, it speaks all around the world normally, uh, lives on an airplane, and right now lives on Zoom like the rest of us. Uh, but it is my privilege to introduce you to Jeff White, Technical Director at Bedbug Central. And Jeff, if you want to take it away. Thank you, Ross. Uh, let me uh, share my screen here and get everything up and running. And I'll give a quick intro of myself and we'll go from there. So thank you, Ross. Thank you, the team at Sprague, for inviting me and, and Bedbug Central to be part of today's training seminar. Um, as Ross alluded to, you know, for the last 15 plus years, I've been traveling, traveling the country uh, and, and the world for that matter, uh, you know, learning about bed bugs, uh, training them in all different environments. Um, you know, it's been a, it's been an adventure. It's been a privilege. Um, and, you know, I'm here today to share some of my knowledge and perspective on, on the issue of bed bugs, uh, where things were, uh, where they currently are, and maybe most interestingly, where are they going? Um, you know, whether it's, you know, the future of bed bugs themselves, how COVID is gonna impact bed bugs, at least in the next, let's say year or so, we're gonna talk a little bit about all that. Um, if anybody ever has any questions, you know, for me in the future, you can always reach me at jeff.white at bedbugcentral.com. Um, I'm pretty active on email, so I, I will respond to you if you email me. Um, yeah, like I said, uh, you know, we'll, we'll take some questions at the end. So please hold questions um, in, until we get to the end of the uh, session and uh, we'll open it up and, and we'll, we'll fire away accordingly. Alrighty, so let's get started. So, you know, when we talk about bed bugs, you know, back, you know, before, let's say World War II, you know, bed bugs were a very prevalent issue, uh, you know, in the United States and around the world. Um, a lot of the same stories you hear today, you will hear, you know, people tell from back in the 30s and 40s. Um, obviously, I was not around during those times, but I have had the experience of, of talking to people who were. And, uh, you know, a lot of the same things, like I said, you hear today, you know, people riding buses and being fearful of it being exposed to a bed bug or, you know, whatever the case may be, you'll hear a lot of parallels. You know, they always say history repeats itself. And, you know, that is what we're seeing today when we talk about the bed bug issue. Uh, around World War II, you know, pesticides were introduced to the marketplace um, that virtually eliminated bed bugs from the United States. Um, you could still, you know, hear of, of pockets and, and, and stories, um, you know, all through the 80s and 90s and whatnot. But again, they were very isolated. Um, you know, there were a handful of people that had any experience with bed bugs <clears throat> prior to them making their comeback around, you know, the year 2000. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with those pesticides that we were using for many, many years. You know, pesticides that would remain active inside people's homes for months and, and, and many times years after they were applied. And in essence, they protected people's homes from the introduction of bed bugs. Obviously, due to environmental concerns and many other factors, a lot of those pesticides that we were once using are no longer available to us today. And, and for good reason, in most instances, you know, they don't break down, which is what I was just talking about, where you know they were active for several years after they were applied. But obviously, that's not good for for outdoor uh, environmental impacts and whatnot. And so the bottom line is, is you know when we look at bed bugs today, you know this is a, a a human population heat map. And so all the areas that you see the darker red are areas where we have concentrations of people. Um, we don't have a map like this for bed bug populations, but honestly, you know one of the things that everybody always says is is bed bugs go where people go. And so I would imagine that a lot of the, the, the bed bug, you know, populations and the spread of bed bugs is probably very similar to the map that we see in front of us right now. But what we know is that, listen, bed bugs are back and they're here to stay. You know, they're not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, you know, we, we've seen new tools hit the market since the resurgence started around 2000. Uh, we've learned a ton over the last 20 years. We are, you know, in a way better place today than we were even five or 10 years ago. 
But what I can say pretty comfortably is that we're going to be dealing with bed bugs for the foreseeable future. It's very interesting to look at the spread of bed bugs in regards to why certain communities, why certain towns, and why certain states have issues with bed bugs while others don't. You know, one uh, area I talk about all the time is Ohio. You know, Ohio has been largely regarded as, you know, one of the bed bug capitals of the United States. You know, and for those of you, you know, obviously many of you are in the Pacific Northwest. I'm on the East Coast in New Jersey. So Ohio is not too far from us. And, you know, if you've ever been to Ohio, you know, and I don't mean this in a negative way, it's, it's not necessarily, nothing about it, you know, feels particularly unique or standout-ish. And uh, yet it has massive bed bug issues. And so a lot of times we ask why, you know, why is that? Why is Ohio such a hotbed? And I don't know that anybody knows the answers. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum is why is my, why does Miami not have the issues that you would think it would? You know, we know that, you know, Miami is a melting pot, you know, even more so than a lot of other areas of our, of our country in regards to different groups coming in and out all the time, not to mention it's very warm in Miami, which does impact bed bug reproduction. And you talk to a lot of Miami-based companies, pest control companies, and, you know, there's just not a huge issue. And so it poses a lot of interesting questions when we talk about why certain communities, and even in your area, you'll have one town that has massive issues, and then the next one over doesn't. And so very interesting questions that, you know, I'm just here to just generally kind of mention things that we're thinking about, you know, and I think if we can start to understand those trends, we can really start to understand and impact bed bugs long term. But the bottom line is, is bed bugs are back. They're here to stay. You know, if you don't have an issue today, doesn't mean you're not going to have an issue tomorrow. And just because you're overrun today, doesn't mean you're going to be overrun next year if you take the proper steps to actually get on top of the problem. One of the few things we do know about bed bugs is that they do definitely demonstrate a seasonal trend. Um, you know, you guys, or for most of you, should be in a, a cold or seasonal area of our country where we do have a winter, a spring, a summer, and fall. And in environments like that, we definitely see a seasonal trend with bed bugs where we see populations, you know, expand in the summer months, where we see reports sometimes go up two and threefold where they are in the winter months. Um, when the trend specifically happens, often changes uh, by year, but more or less it's in July, August, and September that we see our biggest issues with bed bugs. What I can tell you about this year is that we seem to be seeing a little bit of a late, um, we'll call it surge in bed bug activity. Uh, that's probably largely due to COVID at this point. Uh, I'll talk about COVID in a few slides and how it impacts bed bugs. Um, but really, honestly, I would say in the last three to four weeks, we've started to see a significant increase in bed bug activity in many areas of the country. Now, that might be due to, you know, COVID restrictions lifting. You know, we don't know exactly what's driving that. Um, but the bottom line is, is you know, and, and the intent of this slide is to say that when we get back to normal, whatever that looks like, um, July, August, and September is when we typically see an increase in bed bug activity. And there's a lot of different reasons. You know, number one, people are moving around a lot more. They're traveling, they're vacationing, and what they're then end up doing is spreading bed bugs. We also know that it's warmer inside of a lot of people's homes, especially those of us that don't have air conditioning in place. And so that increases bed bug reproduction. But the bottom line is, is summer does seem to be when bed bugs are most active. Um, and so, like I said, you know, it depends on where you're at in regards to how significant this trend is. You know, if you talk to companies in the southern part of the United States, uh, Arizona, uh, Florida, for instance, they do not see that seasonal trend be quite as dramatic. Um, maybe because the temperatures are, are more consistently warm. They also don't have that, um, you know, concentrated vacation time quite as much as we do in the northern states where you know they're they're usually active year-round with garage sales and moving and all that different stuff while listen everybody knows in, in the north you know when's moving season moving season is usually in the summer people sell their houses in the spring and they're moving around in the summer and so all those kinds of things impact bed bug flow as far as COVID is concerned you know i wanted to address this early because I'm sure many of you were thinking of it, you know, what is the impact of COVID on bed bugs? Listen, bed bugs in a lot of ways are a lot like a virus um, in terms of how they spread. You know, they spread by people going and seeing other people, traveling around, shopping, bringing furniture in, 
And when we talk about social distancing and we talk about people not moving around the same way they were pre-COVID, it inevitably has to impact the flow of bed bugs. Um, you know, and so the bottom line is, is if people are social distancing and staying home, we should see less bed bug infestations. And in fact, we have. Now it depends on the environment you're in in regards to what that impact is. You know, when we talk about single family homes, um, we've definitely see a seen a reduction in bed bug infestations, but it has not been as dramatic, at least in regards to reports, as it has been in apartments. Now, here's the trick, though. Just because people may not be reporting it in apartments doesn't mean they aren't there. And that, to me, is what many of the experts are talking about right now, which is we know bed bugs were in a lot of these buildings before COVID hit. And we're not seeing a ton of reports come in quite yet, but we know they were there before it started, so they have to still be there. And if they are, they're probably reproducing, populations are probably going. And so a lot of the questions that many of the experts have been talking about behind the scenes is, when is that dam gonna break? You know, there's got to be bed bugs behind the doors. And so the, the most important part of this message, you know, for many of you on this, this uh, webinar is, don't turn your backs on this. You know, I know COVID presents us with a lot of unique challenges, whether it's getting access to people's apartments, whether it's finding a place for them to go while it's being treated. You know, maybe they're not paying rent and therefore you don't have the revenue to pay the pest control. You know, there's a lot of different questions and issues here. But what I can tell you is none of those impact bed bugs. If bed bugs are behind those doors, they're reproducing and they're growing. And so you need to be thinking about how you're going to address those issues. Because like I said, just because people aren't saying something doesn't mean they're not there. And so the bottom line is, is COVID will definitely reduce bed bug activity until, uh, you know, people get back to some sort of normal flow of business. Whether that's six months, whether that's a year, I don't know. Um, but just know that we will probably see a reduction in bed bug activity at some level probably in the 25 to 50 percent range depending upon the environment um again not to say they're going away but that's kind of the, the impact of covid and i can talk more about it in the question and answer session if, if we want to go that direction so when we talk about apartment communities and we talk about the flow of bed bugs you know this is the number one way with which bed bugs get around you know if you're on an apartment community if you're a manager you know in, in whatever community you're in um, you know, figuring out how to deal with discarded furniture is a huge way to reduce the flow of bed bugs within communities. A lot of people put this stuff out, other people see it, they don't have these types of items, they go out and they take them in. Um, and obviously bed bugs a lot of times are traveling with these items. A lot of people talk about hotels being a major source of bed bugs, but to be honest with you, you know, many hotels don't have the issues that, that a lot of people think that they do. The statistics in the pest control industry suggest that one to two percent of a given hotel's rooms at any given time will have an issue with bed bugs. And so one to two out of a hundred is really what you're looking at. And in the past 10 years, I've personally stayed at probably over 200 hotels and found bed bugs two or three times, which is very consistent with that one to two percent. And a lot of times those infestations are small. They're three to five bed bugs. And so even if you're exposed to them, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to take one home with you if it's that small of a problem. And so a lot of focus is put on hotels. And again, I'm not here to say that hotels don't have issues. I'm not here to tell you that they don't need to be addressed. And I'm not here to tell you that staying in a hotel room that has bed bugs doesn't stink. I've done it before. I've experienced it. It's not a lot of fun. Um, but again, it's not nearly as common as people think that it is. The bottom line though, when we talk about bed bugs, you know, human's greatest enemy is just their own ignorance of the problem. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I just mean that in that they don't understand that bed bugs are a problem. They don't understand how to avoid them. They don't understand where they got them from. And they don't understand what to do with them when they do find them inside their house. And these, you know, if we talk about bed bugs and their greatest power that they have is taking advantage of our own ignorance of their existence. That is really what we're talking about when we talk about bed bugs. When we talk about, you know, apartments, um, <clears throat> A lot of people will tell you that you know apartments are really where we've seen the the greatest uh, amount of issues when it comes to bed bugs. We know discarded furniture is a major factor in a lot of these buildings. But the bottom line is, is when we get to high rise multifamily housing, it's very easy for these bugs to move around. You know, they can go from one unit to another within 24 hours or less. You know, we actually have data. I'm not going to talk about in today's presentation, where we there's actually been a study done 
where they put bed bugs into an apartment and within three days they were finding them in surrounding units. And so we know that they can move very easily through these buildings. And then you also have the social nature of your residents, which are visiting each other, spreading bugs around. And so the bottom line, when we talk about bed bugs, you know, apartment communities are really where we've seen our biggest issues. The bugs can move very, very easily within them. And if you don't manage, you know, high rise, let's say you manage garden style, it doesn't you know, mean that you're not gonna have issues. I've seen, we actually dealt with a garden style apartment complex here in, in New Jersey where I'm based that had something like a 30% infestation rate across a thousand plus apartments, hundreds of apartments. And so it's definitely something you need to be in tune to no matter what type of environment you're in. And then lastly, you know, listen, bed bugs can make their way into public environments, whether it's offices, schools, you know, emergency rooms. A lot of times these environments are about introductions rather than reproducing infestations. I don't wanna spend a ton of time going through this as this can be an hour long talk in and of itself. Just know a lot of times it's about monitoring in these environments, keeping an eye on things, and then making sure the people that are within the space are educated on the topic of bed bugs and what to do if they think they have them at home. When we talk about you know, the root though of bed bug issues, you know, bed bugs in lower socioeconomic settings is, is really you know, what we're talking about. Most, I would say, you know, a, a, a huge portion of my own experience with bed bugs has been in type, you know, Section 8 affordable housing type, type environments. Um, you know, the bottom line is, is we see people bringing bed bugs into these environments. And there's a lot of different factors that go on in these settings, you know, whether it's people's own attention span in regards to all the other issues that they're dealing with and then being able to focus on bed bugs being one of those that needs to be addressed. You know, there's, there's just so many issues at play in these communities, but the bottom line is, is we're seeing a lot of bed bug activity in affordable housing. And Rutgers did a study where they found 12.3% of apartments were found to have bed bugs in uh, a bunch of different affordable housing buildings here in Northern New Jersey. Um, and so, you know, 12 out of every 100 apartments in affordable housing was testing positive for bed bug activity. And when you start to, you know, do the monetary impact of that issue, it, it can be pretty dramatic. Um, and so we know bed bugs, you know, and it's not for all, I want to say one quick thing. It's not all affordable housing communities. I have gone into a couple that have like a 5% less, 3%, 1% infestation rate. But we also have been in some apartment communities that have 30 to 40% infestation rates. You know, I dealt with a building in Newark, New Jersey, um, where they had, I forget what the number was. I think they had over 600 apartments, not infested total in the buildings. And I think we were dealing with something like 250 of them that actually tested positive for bed bugs. So don't think that this can't become a massive problem for you if you're not paying attention. Um, but the bottom line is, is affordable housing is where we've seen a lot of our issues. And whether it's affordable housing or not, you know, you have to keep your eyes open when it comes to bed bugs. If you're being reactive, if you're waiting for people to report the problem, this is the kind of stuff that can and does happen. You know, this is an individual we dealt with here in Trenton, New Jersey. Um, you know, the bed bugs were reported in his apartment because somebody saw one on the outside of his front door. You know, we went in to uh, inspect and treat the situation. He comes to the door. He's got bed bugs running all over his shirt. He's got, you know, visible evidence all over the collar of his shirt. And, you know, this is the kind of individual that's not going to say anything. And I can't tell you how many times I've talked with property managers that are like, oh, that would never happen in my building. I can tell you that it happens in everybody's building all the time. And so, you can't, there's a lot of data out there that suggests if you're waiting for people to report things, this is the kind of stuff you will eventually see. And this is a video we took in a single family home. Um, but the bottom line is, is, and you know, this is the kind of stuff that you can see in these really bad infestations. And I'll let this just play for like 10, 15 seconds. I'm not going to let the whole video play. I just want everybody to get an understanding of how bad it can truly get. Um, if you turn your back on them, people aren't reporting them. <clears throat> Now, obviously, in this home, you have uh, how many bugs? Millions, probably. I don't. I have no idea. Hundreds of thousands. Easy. Um, and you know, 
I'm going to just let it go from there. You know, what we have there is obviously a really bad problem. Um, and people see things like that. And a lot of questions are raised. How does that happen? You know, how are those people living in that environment? You know, and then you start thinking to yourself, how could that ever happen to any of the things that I deal with and manage? And what I can tell you is, is I haven't seen an infestation that bad in an apartment setting. I've seen them really bad, but not quite that bad. A lot of the really hellacious infestations that we deal with are in single family homes because the situation is isolated in that home and it can go for long periods of time and nobody says anything in apartments those bugs would have been found in the hundreds in the halls way before it ever got that bad and so the bottom line though is is bad does happen and when we talk about how you know you really need to talk about mental health you know, in these situations, a lot of people, you know, make the joking comment, who would live in a situation like that? And the true answer is nobody. You know, nobody in their right mind would live in a situation like that. And that's the honest truth. You know, almost 100% of the time when we deal with a bad infestation like that, someone in the home has a mental health issue. And so we go back to what we said before, which is that, you know, people aren't reporting the problem. That's one of the factors is that there's a mental health issue at play. You know, that guy I showed you a second ago, he came to the door and I had to convince him for 15 minutes to let me into his apartment. He wanted nothing to do with it. He was perfectly content having the bugs running all over him at all times. And so these are the kinds of things you need to be thinking about. I hope you don't deal with these things. And if you stay on top of the issue and your eyes wide open about it, you hopefully shouldn't have to. But I can tell you a lot of property managers that take a reactive approach and wait for people to report it, these things do happen. And in, in senior high rise, uh, data has actually uh, suggested that 70% of seniors in high rise affordable housing buildings are completely unaware that they have bed bugs. And, you know, take a second to think about that. 70% of seniors are totally unaware they have bed bugs. Seven out of 10 infestations in a senior building, the people have no clue. And so you start thinking about that and you can see how this problem can get much, much bigger then people are prepared for very quickly. And we've seen that happen so many times. We'll have a property manager come to us and let's say they oversee 200 units and they come to us and they say, listen, we found 10 that have bed bugs. What do we do next? And I'm like, listen, you need to probably do a whole building inspection. And so we do it and we, found, we find 42 units that have bed bugs. And they're like, what happened here? And I was like, the 10 that reported it, you know, and, and, and I go back to this data and I say, you had 10 that reported it. We found 42. That 70% is, is a pretty accurate number at that point. And so a lot of times people just aren't saying anything for a lot of different reasons. And we look at the different bed bug infestations. What data has also suggested is that all, let's say 42 of those infestations, when they look at the bed bugs genetically, will all trace back to one or two genetic profiles which means that typically in these badly infested buildings, it all starts with one or two introductions. And just those problems are allowed to go and they turn into massive issues. Lastly, we know bed bugs bite, you know, everybody's seen all the, the images of, of, of bed bug bites. We know everyone reacts differently. We also know 30% of people don't react at all. You never want to diagnose the source of a problem based upon bite symptoms. If you ever have anybody come to you and say they're being bit by something, you want to conduct an inspection to try to confirm the source. I've seen bed bug bites. You know, I've seen all kinds of things look like bed bug bites. Um, you just never know what the source of a bite is. We know bed bugs cannot transmit any diseases. Uh, in labs, you might see stories that have talked about Chagas and trench fever. It's not something you should be concerned about. At this point, most medical experts believe that bed bugs will not be a significant vector of human health pathogens anytime soon. The one thing you do need to be aware of, though, is lawsuits. Um, you know, lawsuits are, I don't want to say that they're on the rise. I was actually just talking with an attorney this morning that wants to bring me in uh, to a lawsuit in the Midwest. Um, just know that they're out there. Um, a lot of these have to do with, you know, high rise type situations that suddenly have hundreds of units that have bed bugs in them. Um, the bottom line, and, and this is another topic that I could do a whole hour on. Um, your paperwork should tell a story. You know, if you go back and look at the paperwork your pest control provider is providing you, you should be able to determine what they found, 
what they did to get rid of it, if they did, you know, found any obstacles, um, what it, where did they treat, what protocol did they use? And if you can take your, your, your paperwork and, and kind of repaint the picture, you know, that's what an expert would do in a court case. And a lot of times lawyers don't want tough cases. What lawyers are typically looking for are pest control providers or property management companies that aren't documenting anything, that are saying, you know, it was a bad bed bug infestation. I treated for bed bugs. Because then when questions are asked, you can't gather information to defend anybody's position. And so it becomes a settlement in, in, a, in a courtroom. And so the bottom line when it comes to lawsuits, just know that they're out there. Know that, listen, there's some big numbers being thrown around with some, some bigger lawsuits. You need to make sure your paperwork is telling a story. And uh, as long as you're being smart and upfront about your bedbug situation, you should be able to large in part, you know, avoid a lot of these, these lawsuits going around. So when we talk about where is the bed bug issue heading, um, to me, you know, long term, I, I think bed bugs are going to look a lot like German roaches, not physically. They're going to look differently than German roaches, but in terms of the spread and where we find bed bugs. You know, your occasional oops infestation in single family homes, your prevalent, you know, bed bug infestations are probably going to be in multifamily housing. Uh, you're occasionally going to see them in public settings here and there. And that's very similar to where we find German cockroaches. You find one-offs in single family homes, but most of your issues in our, are in apartment communities. And it's not all apartment communities, it's just some. And so I think that's probably where bed bugs are going long-term. So as we start to transition into treatment, um, I, one second while I pull up the clock so I can keep an eye on my time. I want to make sure that you know, I don't necessarily care about the actual infestation sizes on this slide. This is what we have taught pest control companies for a long time, which is split your bed bug infestations into different categories. A low, a moderate, and a high, a low and a high. I don't care what, you know, levels you use. What I do want to make a point of on this slide is that what you do for a bed bug infestation of five bed bugs should not be the same in regards to what you do for an infestation of 500 bed bugs. And that's the point of this information, is that when your pest control provider or you as a management company or whatever the case may be, goes in and evaluates the situation, you know, your reaction does not need to be the same for all infestation sizes. And so you want to make sure that your pest control company is paying attention to those factors. And we're going to talk more about that in a second. But you know, what you do for an infestation of five is not the same in regards to what you do for an infestation of 500. So when we talk about, you know, what's out there in regards to controlling, you know, bed bugs, what I want to do in this section is just kind of talk big picture about what's out there. Um, you know, there's no one way to kill bed bugs. There's a lot of different ways to kill bed bugs. And I can handle some of the off, you know, topic type questions in the Q&A section. But just know that, you know, pesticides, you know, you're going to see a lot of information out there about bed bug resistance to pesticides. That does not mean pesticides don't work. You know, and in fact, most pest control companies are still using pesticides. What that information tells us is that you shouldn't just rely on pesticides. There should be other things built into your protocol to help you address bed bug infestations. You know, they make up an important part, but there should be other things there. And so as far as resistance is concerned, you know, it is a problem and it is something that needs to be paid attention to. And there is a lot of resistance out there, but you know, as far as how you overcome it, you, you, you begin considering other tools in addition to pesticides in your bed bug protocol. And so when you talk about pest control companies and what the industry is doing large in part when we talk about bed bugs, you know, a lot of pest control companies are definitely using some sort of dust pesticide. And what that means is that we know bed bugs hide in cracks and crevices. And so bed bugs don't want to be just sitting out on a wall. They don't want to be standing on top of the mattress and just hanging out there because then people see them and kill them. They want to hide. And so a lot of times they go into cracks and crevices. And how you deal with those cracks and crevices in terms of pest control is you go in and you treat the cracks and crevices with some sort of dust or pesticide product. And so Using a dust in your protocol is an extremely important part of bed bug management. And it's something you should be either seeing or, you know, everybody's going to be different on this call in regards to whether you're a property manager or whatever the case may be. But the bottom line is, is, is treating cracks and crevices with a dust 
is a very important part of bedbug treatment. In terms of non-chemical options, there's a lot of different things out there that you can consider. Um, the bottom line is, is you need to be thinking about things other than pesticides. And so vacuums is a great thing that you can use. You know, you can remove bed bugs with a vacuum. Um, if you do use a vacuum to address bed bug infestations, you want to make sure you're emptying the vacuum out uh, after vac you know, bugs are, are sucked up. Um, for my property managers on the call, you know, you're going to have residents come to you and say, listen, what can I do before the pest control guy comes to treat bed bugs? Uh, in that instance, you know, you can, you know, use a vacuum, uh, remove the bed bugs that you see, and just let the resident or whoever's doing it know they have to get rid of the, the bugs once they're done. Whether it's throwing the bag out, whether it's cleaning the HEPA filter out, um, but vacuums will harbor bed bugs. That said, they're a great way to remove and reduce the number of bed bugs present in a home. Steam is another thing you'll hear thrown around out there in regards to bed bug treatment. Steam is not something that your typical or most pest control companies are not doing in mass, meaning that I'm not going to come into your home and treat it for bed bugs and steam all your furniture just because. Uh, there may be some pest control companies out there that, that position themselves as cleaning companies, but most pest control companies are not. What they're using steam to do is to kill bugs and eggs on contact. And so a lot of times eggs for bed bugs are glued onto the surface. And so when you go over that, those eggs with a steamer, you can kill them uh, right where they are. A vacuum probably won't pick those eggs up off the surface. And so the bottom line is, is that steam is another great tool for bed bug treatment to kill bugs and eggs on contact. Bed encasements are a way to dramatically ease the treatment of beds, specifically box springs. You know, many of us, I mean, listen, if I went around this room today and I said, how many times a year do you see the bottom of your box spring? What do you think the average for the people in this room would be? I bet, yeah, I bet zero would be a big fat answer for a lot of us. I know mine might be one because the dog lodged himself underneath and I got to go find the dog or something like that. I mean, it's going to be basically zero or one, you know, but think about it. How close is that box spring to that person sleeping in the bed? a foot, two feet, and there's a million hiding places inside of it. And so box springs are very common areas that are infested. If you have a pest control provider come in and they don't get to the bottom of that box spring, find a new company. Like, I, I can't be any more blunt than that. Like, if, if uh, somebody doesn't know that bed bugs hide in box springs and isn't addressing box springs, that's a major problem. And so the bottom line is, is encasements are a way that you can ease the treatment of mattresses and box springs. You can salvage the mattress of box spring. And then you can make follow-ups even easier because bugs are stuck on the outside of those encasements. In regards to the encasements, there are ones designed specifically for bed bugs, and those are the ones you should be targeting when we talk about encasements for bed bug treatment. And I'll talk, I can answer questions about encasements, you know, when we get into the Q&A. And then lastly, you know, monitors. A lot of people think of monitors for detection, and we'll talk about, you know, detecting bed bugs in a second. But there are monitors out there that you can use to reduce the number of bugs between treatments. And so, you know, these are, are very commonly used interception devices. And so what we know about the common bed bug is that they don't climb very well. They walk up the outside of these devices, they fall into that polished, shiny well, and they actually have a very hard time getting out. And so what you do with these, specifically the one on the top left, is you can put it underneath the legs of beds and couches. And so what you do is you leave that in place over the course of treatment and it will capture bed bugs. And so really briefly, this is a study that we did when we first started working with interception devices and to, uh, to expedite the, the process of going through this, just know that we put those devices in 116 apartments. Before we treated the apartments, we found 746 total bed bugs. We then treated them, put the monitors in place. And when we came back seven days later, we collected over 1,600 bed bugs in those devices. 1,600 bed bugs that avoided the treatment that we applied seven days prior. 1,600 bed bugs that were probably hiding somewhere in the clutter or somewhere in the closets. And the bottom line is that 1,600 bed bugs that couldn't then bite the residents sleeping inside those beds. And so we have long spoken about using these monitors, not just to detect bed bugs, but also as part of treatment. And they're helping us be better as a, you know, a pest control company. They're protecting the residents. Now, it's not to say a bug can't access the person sleeping in that bed. They obviously can. But it's reducing the number of bugs that can gain access to the person sleeping in the bed. 
And so the bottom line here is there are another tool that we can use to address the bugs that are hiding in those beds and out off the bed as well. And one last thing I wanna go back to on this slide is, is remember, go back one more, remember these devices. When I get to no prep in a second, these are a huge part of making the no prep approach effective. And so remember interception devices and specifically the top left-hand one is, is a device called Blackout, but there are others out there. The bottom line is, is under the leg interception devices is really what they're largely referred to as. The bottom line when we talk about how to treat for bed bugs, there's really no wrong decisions out there. Um, you know, I shouldn't say that there's no wrong decisions. There's wrong decisions. It's like that one, it, people always say there's no such thing as a bad question. That's complete garbage. There's totally bad questions out there. Um, but the bottom line is, is, you know, there's no one way, I should say, to create an effective bed bug program. There are, there are many ways you can put effective programs together. Uh, the bottom line is, is you want to make sure that whatever company you're using is using a good comprehensive protocol that addresses pesticide resistance by using other tools. Um, and, you know, the bottom line is you'd be highlighting how the service you provide your residents uh, is better and different than, than what other people are talking about. So one last topic I want to talk to before we start to transition into Q&A is a, a no or limited prep approach. Um, you know, when I give this talk to a lot of property management companies and, you know, I've talked to the American Apartment Associations and, you know, you name it, I've talked to a lot of the different bigger associations out there. Um, prep is one of the most um, interesting topics for a lot of those audiences where many of you on this call may have worked with providers that come in and will tell you that you need to prep the home for bed bug treatment. And so when we talk about prep, you know, what does that mean? And for, you know, different pest control companies, it's going to mean different things. But often, you know, it, it basically, you know, means this kind of stuff, which is stripping beds, standing the bed up, pulling the furniture from the walls, emptying the dressers, emptying the closets, laundering all their different personal belongings. And a lot of pest control providers will tell you, I will not treat the apartment unless your residents do these things. And if they go out and find that they didn't do the prep properly, as probably many of you have experienced, they will tell you they can't do the bed bug treatment. So I gotta attack this from about 12 different directions. So the first direction I'll hit is, why do pest control companies ask these things? One of the reasons is because, number one, I, there's really two main reasons I look for here. Number one is that it makes the treatment easier if they're stripping the beds and standing the beds up and this, that, and the other. Which, listen, I, I understand, but if you strip the beds or you have the resident, I should say, strip the beds, where does the resident put the bedding? I have no idea. You know, if they stand the beds up and the beds are standing for a couple hours before the pest control company comes in, the bugs are just going to, you know, scatter and, and, and basically walk through the unit. Well, where are they going? I have no idea. And so the bottom line is, is we often want people to leave things where they are. Let us as a pest control provider come in and address those, those items accordingly. But more importantly, why do they ask people? Because this is, when we talk about pain points, emptying the dresser and emptying the closets is where the pain point is. When you ask a resident to empty the dressers and closets, you know, I always, when I, when I talk about this topic around the country, I always tell people, sit down, on your bed a lot of us are home so you could probably do this right where you're sitting here listening to me talk and so look around the room you know look around your home and what would it take you to empty all of your dressers and closets out and clean everything that you own i think about my seven and nine year olds closets and between the board games and the book the boxes of toys and everything that's in there's probably old like food in there i have no idea what's in there but how long is that gonna take? I estimate in my house, and I live in a typical two-story, you know, two, you know, two kids, wife kind of home, and I would estimate in my home it would take two days to do all this stuff and do it the right way. And the reason a pest control company is asking you to do it is because there might be a bug in the dresser and there might be a bug in the closet. But, most of the infestations we deal with are actually simple infestations. Many of the infestations, and data has suggested that 
90% or more of bed bug infestations are 100 bugs or less. Well, when you have less than 100 bugs, where are most of the bed bugs going to be found? In the beds and couches. That's where bugs are typically. You don't typically see lots of bugs in the dressers and closets until an infestation gets out of control. And so 90% or more are less than 100 bugs. So when a pest control company comes in and asks you to empty all the dressers and closets out, not only is it going to take your residents, God knows how long to do it, is it even necessary? Is it even making a difference in the effectiveness of the treatment? And all the data that we have now suggests probably not. And so what we're saying when we talk about prep, and this is something we've been talking about for years, you know, is make decision based upon the extent of the infestation. If there's only four bed bugs there, if there's only 20 bed bugs there, do you need to be emptying out all the dressers and closets? The answer should be no. You know, and remember, I talked a second ago about those interception devices. Those are integral in making this approach work because we don't worry about one or two bed bugs, right? If there's one or two bed bugs somewhere in that home wandering around, what do those bugs have to do? Remember, bed bugs only feed on blood. In order to grow, in order to reproduce, they have to get blood. And so if they're wandering around the home, where do they eventually have to find their way back to? Beds and couches. And so what we do is we put those interception devices under the legs of the beds and couches. We do as much as possible around those areas and let the bug's biology and behavior slowly pick them off over time. Now, listen, if you go into a situation and you go into one of your apartments or environments and you've got an infestation of 10,000 bed bugs, yes, you're going to need that resident to help you. You're going to need the resident to do things. But that does not make up a large portion of your apartments. That probably makes up 5 to 10 percent. And so when we talk about no prep, what we really mean is no prep prior to the initial bed bug treatment. What we typically train pest control companies on is go in and evaluate the situation. 90% of the time, you're probably not going to have the resident do anything because it's not necessary. And then the other 10%, yes, you might need cooperation, but hopefully it'll be a targeted approach. And Rutgers has actually proven this out. We're in a study of 114 bed bug infested apartments. Rutgers University solved 95% of the 114 bed bug infestations with no involvement by the tenants. And so there's actual data to support this approach. And I can tell you there's still a ton of pest control companies that are not taking this approach, that are still asking people to empty all their stuff out, do all this, that, and the other. And what I can tell you is we've now, I've never taken that approach. Um, and we have been working with many pest control companies all across the country for a while now. And a lot of companies have found a lot of effectiveness with the no prep approach. And so what I want to end with and then transition into Q&A is proactive. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about proactive because my brother Danny, um, who also works with the company, uh, in two weeks will be providing a follow-up webinar where he is going to be discussing what proactive programs look like uh, and different measures you can put in place to address, you know, the introduction of bed bugs through move-in procedures, through move-out procedures. Um, you know, what you can be doing to keep an eye on bugs over time. But what we know is that, you know, there's lots of different approaches, you know, with, with proactive and, and there's a lot of different things you need to be thinking about. You know, if you have a large apartment community, you know, are you doing visuals? Are you installing monitors? How are you managing the time investment in which one? You know, a lot of people are like, you know, just throw monitors into every single apartment and then check them every month. Well, when you start doing time analysis, that's a massive commitment. You know, what is the cost benefit of that approach? You know, what is the reality of, of what you need to do? And, and Danny's going to provide some information on that in around two weeks uh, with the follow-up webinar in regards to what those programs look like. Um, one thing I will say, though, about those programs is a lot of them do utilize the, the monitors we talked about a second ago, where you can go into these units, you can put the monitors in place, and you can check them quarterly, you know, biannually. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. And there's a lot of theory out there now, too, that you can do this. Um, so what, what some Rutgers, for instance, is talking about is going in and doing a whole building inspection and identifying your problematic units, identifying your high-risk units, your units that either had a history, 
are next to a unit that had a history, uh, perhaps are hoarded, overly cluttered, uh, have a history of overcrowding. Those are all high risk units for bed bugs. Maybe you put monitors into those units. And then in the rest of them, you just do a quick walkthrough inspection. There's a lot of different ways you can structure these programs to, to make good, you know, uh, logical decisions in regards to the, to the investment associated with these programs. The bottom line is, is you're trying to better the community and the environment in the community and reduce the incidences of bed bugs across your communities. And I think you can, through some smart, educated decisions, come up with programs like that. And lastly, before we uh, take uh, close up and take some questions here, you know, Rutgers has actually implemented these programs uh, here in New Jersey with a, a building in Jersey City, where it was found to have a 14% infestation rate before the, the program was started. And by the end of year one, they reduced that infestation rate down to 2.2%. And so these proactive programs can definitely have a positive impact in communities. I will tell you, they definitely take some money, some time, and some, some work ethic at the start. But once you get the community to that 2.2% or whatever infestation rate is acceptable, it's a lot easier to keep it there than it is to get it there. Once you get it there, keeping it there is actually fairly straightforward. And so summary, you know, bed bugs are back and here to stay. Uh, what I will tell you about um, that I kind of skimmed over a little earlier that I want to mention now is that when we talk about the relationship between the resident between the pest control provider and the management company, all have to work together and all have to be accountable to their actions. You know, a resident washing their hands and not cooperating when they have a bad infestation is not acceptable. A pest control company not taking, you know, using the proper tools and implementing a solid protocol is not acceptable. And a, a property management company saying, listen, pest control company, you're the expert, you deal with it, is also not acceptable. Everybody has to communicate on all pages to make an acceptable bed bug program. Um, early detection is critical. New tools are deepening our toolbox. And as we talked about you know, before, proactive is gaining traction. The bottom line is if you as a management company, the provider and the, the resident are all talking and working together, Believe it or not, bed bugs can be a fairly straightforward issue and you can truly reduce problems across communities. All right, thank you. And then what we'll do is we'll open it up to our lovely moderator, Mr. Ross Trelevin. Hey Jeff, so uh, first couple of things, when you do this in person, uh, I do like looking around the room and seeing how people start scratching and itching yes. a little bit. You know, it's one of those things that every time we talk about bed bugs, it gets the people's heebie-jeebies get going a little bit. One of the questions somebody asked is vacuuming. Um, when you vacuum them up, will it kill them or are they still alive in the vacuum? No, they're still alive in the vacuum, usually. And so, yeah, that's why I mentioned earlier that, you know, disposing either of the vacuum bag or cleaning out the HEPA filter or whatever the case may be is a really important part of vacuuming because they can maintain uh, alive inside that vacuum over time. And I've actually even seen them start to walk back out of the vacuum uh, if they're not addressed appropriately. So it can be as simple as just taking the bag out and throwing it in an outdoor trash can or whatever the case may be. But the, the vacuum itself does need to be addressed after vacuum. Okay. Um, one of the questions here is, what do you recommend, for instance, where the, the bed or the box spring are directly on the floor? So if the bed or the box spring is on the floor, um, the easiest way to approach that is, is number one, obviously, you can still use the encasements, you know, that will still help the problem. Uh, you can actually still use the monitors, too. You can put the monitors right on the floor. So one of the things that you'll find when you start looking at the monitors, if you do go that direction, is that they um, are usually designed to go under the legs of the beds or couches. Uh, what research has shown is that while they don't catch as many bugs, you can still put them right on the floor next to the beds and couches, and they still will catch bed bugs. And so you can do those kinds of things. But to be honest with you, you know, if you're a management company and you've got a particularly problematic unit and, and you know, the bed is on the floor, I would seriously consider looking into metal bed frames and just purchasing a couple for those types of environments. A lot of times they're very, very manageable investments where you can get a metal bed frame for a bed on the floor for something like 20, 30 bucks usually. And a lot of times if I go to a management company and I say, listen, you guys are willing to buy this resident a metal bed frame to get their bed up off the floor, which makes the everything easier to deal with. A lot of times we'll invest the 20 to $30 to buy that metal bed frame. And so, 
you know, that's, that's kind of an outside the box way to approach it. Most people don't think of buying their residence metal bed frames, but it's, it's a really limited investment. It can actually make a huge difference in the effectiveness of treatment. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and uh, hi to Ted Thorpe, who, uh, answered, who asked that question. Uh, does diatomaceous earth have an effect or does it work on, uh, on bed bugs? So what I'll say about DE, um, which is the, the short you know, name for diatomaceous earth, uh, is there's a couple things to consider. Um, number one is there's a million different forms of diatomaceous earth out there. If you're going to use DE um, for pest control, you want to make sure you're using a DE that was designed for pest control purposes. Uh, using the DE that goes in your pool filter may have no impact on bed bugs. You know, they make DE that you can use as a dietary supplement. You know, I've seen people email me about putting DE on their dog's skin, which, by the way, is probably not the best recommendation. Um, but, you know, the bottom line is, is if you do consider DE, consider the pest control versions. But to be honest with you, there are other dusts out there that have been shown to be more effective. Uh, Cymexa is one of the ones that a lot of the industry, you know, talks about in terms of effectiveness. Uh, but there's a million others out there. It's not to, you know, highlight one in particular. Um, I think there are better choices out there at this point, but it's not to say that it can't work and have a positive impact on a bed bug program. And to be honest with you, we, you know, I was using it with the pest control company I was with on, in New Jersey for, for several years and having success with it. So it can work, um, but I think there's better options out there these days. Okay. Um, going back to that vacuum, how do you treat that vacuum? Um, right. Um, the reason I hesitate is because there's no easy answer to that question. Um, what I would do is, I'm going to take the politically correct answer here. Read the manufacturer's directions on how to clean the vacuum properly. Um, listen, I would dispose of the vacuum bag. If it's a bag vacuum, dispose of it right after you're done. If you do that, you should be able to most likely deal with the issue. As far as the HEPA filter is concerned, obviously empty it out in an, in an outdoor trash can, a, a bag you take outside and throw it outside. And then I will say read, you know, I don't know how to clean HEPA filters well, so I would read the manufacturer directions on how to clean that HEPA filter, and I would follow those directions. Um, the bugs can get into the nooks and crannies of the filter, and it can be a little difficult to clean out. Uh, as far as the vacuum itself, if you take the bag or HEPA filter out shortly after vacuuming the bugs, the framework of the vacuum shouldn't be a huge issue. Um, if, if it is, I'm going to sidestep that question. It depends on the vacuum type. It depends yeah. on a lot of different things. I can't make any one recommendation. Yeah, no worries. I think it's one of those ones where we, we look to, to have all these tools, and then, of course, you don't want those tools to become the thing that uh, creates a, a spread. When it comes to empty units, uh, we dust outlets, Nancy says, um, as a baseline for pest prevention for the next resident. Does this have any sort of impact? That's a great question. Um, the, the short, quick answer is I don't know, nor does anybody else. Um, the deeper answer is can't hurt. Um, you know, there's two different ways that there's two different topics when it comes to vacant units. There's vacant units that have a bed bug problem, and then there's vacant units that don't, that you're just prepping for the next resident. And listen, if you take those actions and you do dust the, the outlet boxes and you maybe put some dust under the baseboards or whatever the case may be, I, I actually know a couple um, apartment buildings, I think here in New York, that are actually now applying pesticides between the walls when the actual building is being constructed as a way to say that it's somehow been addressed for bed bugs, you know, moving forward. Um, these are all things that you can at least be doing to show that you are being proactive as a property manager. And if a lawsuit arises, that's definitely going to hold some water in a courtroom. And so I'm not going to sit here and tell you that those actions are going to prevent bed bugs moving forward. They're definitely not. You know, could they help? Possibly. And it can't hurt. And it's definitely showing you're being proactive at some level. So I, I definitely don't have any major issues. Just make sure you're following label directions and stuff like that. As far as vacant units with bed bugs, that's a whole nother animal. Um, the, the easiest way to answer that question is make sure you're doing everything possible to identify that the unit has bed bugs before the residents move out. Once, you know, Danny's going to talk about it in two weeks. I don't want to steal too much of his thunder. But, you know, one of the things you want to be thinking about is a policy or procedure in place that the minute a resident gives notice, 
go in and do an inspection. And you don't have to position it as a bed bug inspection. You can say, listen, I just want to come in and make sure you didn't wreck the apartment. But the bottom line is, is go in and do an inspection because you'll probably then have four to six weeks to try to better the situation before the resident moves out. Once the resident moves out, there's no food source present in that vacant unit. And you're going to come to me as a pest control professional and say, hey, listen, when can I rent this unit back out? And unfortunately, my answer is it's all a guessing game at that point. You know, there's no definitive way to say when the bed bugs are gone. The only true way to help with vacant units with bed bugs is to try to prevent it from happening in the first place. Well, that makes sense. And I think that uh, any of those proactive things you can do in between, I mean, when especially inspections, right there when you're flipping a unit, let's, uh, let's make sure we get in there and take a look, make sure there's nothing going on. Anything you can do proactive will help you look better in a courtroom if, God forbid, a lawsuit should arise. Uh, Dan Scott says, do you prefer chemical treatments versus heat or fumigations for moderate or heavy infestations? What chemical combinations do you see? So it's a little bit more technical there, but uh, maybe start with the first one. Chemical, heat, fumigation, sort of where, where do you land? Mercedes, Camry, Audi. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of the topic when it comes to all these different treatment methods, you know, they're all just like Mercedes Camry Audi are all different cars, you know, chemical heat fumigation are all different types of services that will all get you to the same place if they're done properly. And so, you know, I was in a courtroom, uh, I used to serve as an expert. And uh, I was in a courtroom in I forget where it was. Oh, Alabama. And you know, I got this question on the stand, which was they were trying to make the point that because the company wasn't using heat, they were therefore negligent because heat was the only way to treat for bed bugs. And so I, I brought up the whole car thing that I just mentioned. And I said, listen, you know, yes, heat is, is fine. I have no issues with heat. It can definitely get rid of bed bugs, you know, but heat typically costs a lot more. And, you know, there's a lot of other things that go into heat treatment. And so, you know, heat to me is just a Mercedes of the bed bug treatment world, where a more traditional approach with pesticides and encasements might be the Toyota Camry. It's still going to get you from point A to point B. It might take a couple extra treatments. It's typically might cost a little bit less. And it's just a matter of what's right for you and your community. You know, and, and that's really where these different treatments fall. You know, I don't really have a preference when it comes to a moderate and high level, to be honest with you. I mean, listen, structural fumigation, is the 100% done in 24 to 48 hours treatment. But I know here in Jersey, you know, for your average, you know, 3,000 square foot home, you're looking at $30,000 for a structural fumigation. And if you're sure. talking about multifamily housing, you could be, it might not even be possible or hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so not typically an option in Northern cities. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've done very few of any fumigations for bed bugs and uh, um, obviously, it, it comes down to client preference for us and chemical versus uh, heat. We call them conventional versus heat treatments. Um, and then also the follow-up to that was, do you have any sort of chemical combinations that you find to be effective? Now, you know, to me, it's when it comes to the pro, so I, I do a, a YouTube show called Bedbug TV. Um, and over the last 10 years, we've been running it. I think I've got like five and a half million views and I've gotten hundreds of emails from it. And, the most common email I get is, you know, my pest control provider used this, this, and this. Are they doing a good job? And I always answer with, there's no way I can tell you the answer to that without seeing how they use those tools. You know, just because you have a screwdriver or a wrench and a hammer doesn't mean you can rebuild a car engine. Just because you have pesticide X, Y, and Z doesn't mean you can do a bed bug treatment. You know, and so it's all about how the tools are applied. Um, you know, and, and, and the protocol that's used, the time that's invested. A better way to tell how, if somebody's doing a good bed bug treatment is often the amount of time they're spending in the apartment or home. You know, if I look at paperwork for a pest control company and I see treated this two bedroom apartment for bed bugs, spent 20 minutes inside the apartment, that's not a good sign. You know, a good thorough bed bug treatment in a two bedroom apartment is probably going to take an hour and a half, let's say one to two hours with two technicians. If I see 20 minutes with one guy, that's not good. And so, because it suggests to me, he took the tools and didn't apply them properly. 
it. You didn't put them in the right places. And so to answer the question, you know, listen, are there some products that are better than others? A little bit. You know, I talked a little bit about Cymexa. You know, there are some liquid residuals that have shown a little bit better performance than others. But honestly, it's much more about the technician that's applying the products, how they're applying them, and the protocol they're using. Uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, Jeff, I have uh, new golf clubs and I don't hit them any better than my old ones. It's more about uh, me as a golfer probably than the, uh, than it is about the tools. And it's probably a similar thing here with the chemicals or the, the methods. As long as we do exactly. them right, they're all probably fairly effective. I, exactly. I try, I try to explain to my friend that buys $3,000 putters that I can probably output him with a rock. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Christopher Harkin says, what kind of, what type of non-chemical options do you find to be the most effective in long-term treatment? Um, you know, I, I, most of the non-chemicals I talked about in the presentation, you know, to me, they're all tools in the toolbox that make up a part of the program. And so encasements and monitors, in my opinion, are the two most impactful um, in terms of day in, day out bed bug treatment. You know, vacuum and steam, you're using as you see bugs. And so they're a little bit more of a niche tool. Um, but when you need them, they're great to have. You know, we talked about heat a second ago. A lot of people consider that a non-chemical. Um, and like I said, heat is fine. I had nothing negative to say about heat. It's just not right for everybody and it's not right for every situation. Um, and so heat's fine, you know, um, as far as other non-chemicals, I'm not sure what else is out there. I think that's kind of the, 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 mo the majority that are focused on. If you can think of any ones I didn't discuss, let me know. Uh, but I think that kind of covers the gamut. Okay. Um, I remember doing my first bed bug job in 2004 in Spokane, Washington, and uh, I was so terrified because I knew nothing about them uh, that I remember taping my shoes uh, and my pants together so like there'd be no there'd be no space where there was uh, any bed bug could crawl some certain area. Again, I I didn't understand uh, bed bugs, and we just got a question very similar to that. Best way to not take them out of the unit with you. What's the best way to not take them with you? All right, that's a great question. So leave anything you can outside of the apartment or home or whatever before you go in. You know what I'm saying? I always joke, I was literally just given a session yesterday and I was talking to the people about personal belongings, you know, and jackets. And so you take your jacket inside the apartment, you're doing work in there. Now you got to put it down somewhere. So you think to yourself, I'm going to be smart and I'm gonna put it on top of the refrigerator. There's no way there's any bed bugs on top of the refrigerator. Well, what's the next thing that happens? You forget it on top of the refrigerator. And so you end up hiding it on yourself. And so don't, anything you can leave outside the apartment, leave outside the apartment. Um, don't sit on any furniture. Don't lean against things if you don't have to. You know, try to make as limited contact with things as possible. If you're going into an apartment to talk to a resident, Talk to them in the kitchen, stand in the middle of the kitchen, stand in the hall, you know, unless there's a really bad infestation where bugs are walking all over the floor, which you're typically not going to encounter, you should really have very limited exposure in that fashion. Um, the number one area that I have had the most incidences picking up bed bugs inside people's homes, and it's only happened twice, has been in the, the uh, treads of my shoes. And so just be a little careful about the treads of your shoes. If you ever go into a bad infestation, you want to check yourself. Remember, you can see bed bugs with the naked eye. So just take a look at, you know, your shoes and your clothes. The same way you'd almost handle a tick inspection if you were in a wooded environment and you were concerned about ticks or anything like that. Check yourself. You can see them. Um, and then lastly, research has actually shown that some of the normal pest control product repellents can be effective for bed bugs. And so your higher percentage DEET products will work for short amounts of time. Uh, and so when I go into really bad infestations, um, I never said this because I don't know what falls in regards to the label directions, but I will apply a little bit to my shoes and lower legs and stuff like that. Not directly on your skin. Um, and I, I'll play my politically correct card. Read the directions on the repellents you're using in regards to how to properly apply them to your body and self. Um, but yeah, the, some of the repellents have been shown to work. The higher the percentage of DEET, the better they typically work. Well, that makes sense. I appreciate that because the last thing, even when we have new people and um, they don't know much and they go out on a job like that, the first thing there is, I'm not going to bring them home with me, am I? I mean, it's the, it's the number one paranoia thing I think we get in our industry. I did, not, I did it once. It was a lovely conversation with my wife, so oh, I, I understand. Gosh. Yeah, I can only imagine. So last question for you today. What kind of reporting should our team do internally with the paperwork from our pest control company? 
So you're saying get, get the paperwork in from the pest control company and what do you do from there? Yeah, what do you do from there? Uh, so basically, you know, I know with a lot of the apartment complexes I worked with back in the day, you know, they would have folders that they would create for every individual unit. You know what I'm saying? Where they'd have almost like a case file they'd create. And so, you know, they, obviously nowadays a lot of things are electronic and paperwork isn't the same as it was even 10 years ago. But the bottom line is, is in my opinion, you want to organize it by apartment or by area or whatever your community is. You want to make sure you're keeping it all in one spot so it's easy to pull and reference as needed. Um, beyond keeping it in one place, you know, I, I don't know that you need to do necessarily much more. Obviously pay attention to it. Um, you know, if you see a bed bug infestation that's taking four, five, six treatments, you know, that's something you're going to want to note and say, hey, listen, guys, what's going on here? Um, don't wait for your pest control company to bring the issue to you. Sometimes take the issue to them and say, listen, something, this is going on and on. We need to address this. Um, but to be honest with you, from a legal perspective, you know, if you are, you know, subpoenaed for your paperwork, you know, as long as you can access it in a relatively quick fashion and show that you were taking measures to review it and whatnot, you know, other than keeping it in one place, I don't know that you necessarily need to do much more. Okay. All right. Well, and you know, it sounds like keeping organized with the paperwork and making sure you're not losing track of those things is really the most important part and making sure you're getting good documentation from your pest control provider. Absolutely. That's number one thing. Make sure the pest control provider, and when you do deal with your pest control provider, if they are still providing handwritten reports, make sure it's legible. Legi you know, the lack of legibility is not an excuse in a courtroom. So make sure you can read it. Um, we just did get a last question here. I know I said that was the last question, That's but uh, what's the best way to price a bed bug service, square foot, price per bedroom? You know, um, how, do you, how do you price those out? million different ways to do it. It's going to depend upon the pest control com company. Um, I've seen companies, I mean, listen, in the end with all service providers, time is money. And so that is what pricing breaks down to with any service provider out there in that they're probably going to have a dollar per hour they're looking to achieve. And however long the work takes to render is going to be what the job costs. Um, and so no different than a plumber, no different than an electrician, no different than anything else. As far as how they come up with that price, every company is going to be different. I've seen companies price it out by room. I've seen companies price it out by bed. I think the most important thing actually, though, is that you're seeing some sort of differentiation between infestation level. Yeah. A simple bed bug infestation should not cost you as much as a bad bed bug infestation does. You know, and that's like when you take your car to the mechanic, if you're taking it in for oil changes every 3,000 miles, you're typically not going to see a bill above $100. But if you're waiting seven years to take your car to the mechanic, it's going to get ugly when you do. And so it's, it's no different than that analogy. Yep. Yep. In the end, it's all based on time. Yep. Well, Jeff, I really appreciate you joining us today. Um, thanks for promoing the fact that Danny's going to be joining us here in two weeks uh, for No Prep Bed Bug Solutions. That's September 30th uh, at 10 o'clock Pacific time. You can sign up on our website. I really appreciate your time today. Thanks for taking all the questions. Thanks for your presentation and thanks for your partnership. I agree, Ross. Thank you for having me. And, and like I said, anytime anybody has any questions, don't ever hesitate to reach out. I'm always happy to help. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, everybody, for joining us.